been working till seven o'clock. I'm nearly always asleep by four. I just feel like walking out, but uh, I can't go anywhere at all because all the doors are locked and you have to have a pass to go from one floor to the other. It's awful and terrible. When I first went into the factory, things were much more leisurely than they are now. It was, you know, the sense of pride belonging to the company, but with increased mechanisation, of course, and the pace is so great that really all you are is a number in the factory. At the beginning, when people join us, we give them all a short introductory talk, which outlines the main regulations which have to be observed. It is an extremely large firm, and if we didn't have one or two things that people had to remember not to do, chaos would ensue. Twenty-five years ago, it was a privilege to work at the Players' Factory in Nottingham. Players' Angels, the factory girls were called then. There was a waiting list to get in, as wages were competitively high. Today, the basic wage for women is only £8.10, and there's a severe labour shortage problem. Two years ago, Jill Smith left school and went to work at the Players' Factory. Jill was doing a monotonous job on a cigarette packing machine. She's quite bright and has been promoted to front girl, but she wants to leave as soon as she can find something more interesting to do. She may not have enough initiative to find another job. I don't really know what else I'd like to do instead now. I think I've been there too long. I've got sort of set in my ways, but I, w I definitely do want to leave. I don't want to stay there very much longer. It's, you know, it's so boring. Um, I always used to want to do nursing when I was at school. And now I think I'll be a bus conductor. <laughs> like Jill, Irene Fowler went to Players as soon as she left school. But that was 25 years ago, and she's still doing the same job she began at 15. Her younger brothers and sisters were able to receive more education and find interesting work. However, she's devoted her energy and intelligence to the trade union movement. Despite her efforts, she's been unable to achieve her main objective, which is equal opportunities for women in management. Well, I was very lucky some years ago to be granted a scholarship to the Nottingham University for a day release course. And um, I was the only woman among 15 men who was given this scholarship. And I, I was very, very grateful of getting this scholarship because it did give me the opportunity of getting further education. And since having done this day release course, that the three men who were working in the industry have been given promotion. But of course, me being a woman, I, I haven't even, hasn't even been mentioned to me any type of promotion whatsoever. Janine Clark, who is 24, is employed as a personnel officer. Theoretically, she's accessible to any of the hundreds of girls working in Factory 3 who have problems. In practice, many would not dream of taking their troubles to her. She is considered to be part of the management, and therefore they are suspicious of her. She has studied at Manchester and Cardiff universities. This is always one of the difficulties in personnel work, as to whose side are you on. Are you management, or are you the other side of the fence? And when it comes down to it, in the end, you're management. It's something that you discuss and you have problems posed to you during the course that I did. Um, because you are working and providing facilities and providing a service for both sides. But when it comes to making a decision, you're carrying out management policy. Oh, don't let me... 
come home at lunchtime because if you stay well we're in the factory for 10 hours now and I think if I stayed in at dinner time went up into the restaurant oh I'd go crazy I like to come out for the break I even look forward to riding home on the special bus at dinner time it breaks the day up you know I'd go mad if I stayed in there all day well, she's not going to marry she's still going to live with that chap oh charming fellow members I still maintain that we do want equal pay but also we want equal opportunities alongside our male colleagues to rise a little further than the humdrum job we started when we came in the factory and are expected to continue to do so till maybe if we stay there long enough we retire. I have maintained all through my uh, association with the trade union movement that when the young people come in the factory let's give them some form of education, day release etc etc. Hey Miss and Bill and Ben, do you want to come? Yeah of course do. My friend, on top of the flower pot, all that flutter buys. Off they went again. Depends on anything wrong there, doesn't it? Julian's my friend, and the reason I think that we get on so well together and that I like her is because she's so very much like me. She thinks all the things are funny that I think, you know. We've both got the same sort of reactions to stupid things, which some girls would turn around and call me mad. But Jo just joins in and laughs. She thinks it's good, too. Who do you think, Bill? Ben? Right. No, Bill. <laughs> what annoys me about the factory is the fact that we can't get out the factory. And uh, when I've asked sometimes if I can leave early, I've waited up to half an hour before the time I want to go before I know I can go. That's I think right, it's yeah. a disgusting state of affairs. Yeah. Well, there shouldn't yeah, be yeah. any, you can I do this and can I do that. We should be able to go and say to the management, I can't work tonight, I'm going at my normal time. Well, that ought and to that's be it. it. That ought well, to they're be not, it. they give you the lip, they've got no girls. That's it. They've got no girls, and why haven't they got they girls? Of course, there's a petty restrictions. Have any of you ever worked for us before? Yes, I have. A while ago, and I expect you'll find things have changed this in the meantime. Mm -hmm. The hours, for instance, uh, we're now on a 40 hour week instead of a 42 hour week. We work from 8 till 5, and we have an hour's break for lunch from 1 till 2. We have a quarter of an hour tea break in the morning, and a quarter of an hour tea break in the afternoon if you're working overtime. And as I think you all already know, you have to work the overtime that you're requested to do. And that can involve working till 6 and sometimes even 7 o'clock in the evening and some Saturday mornings 8 till 12. You'll find that Players is a very punctual company and that the doors close promptly at 8 o'clock in the morning and again at 2 in the afternoon. They do open again at 8.15 and 8.30 and again at 2.15 and 2.30. And if it's pouring with rain, they'll open in the meantime but they won't let you go out to your department. If you want to leave your department for some reason, um, you get a pass-out slip from your foreman and you will find that if you wander around without it, you'll be challenged by the doormen on the door. One or two people would be popping off unless we had some sort of check on them. I have to win their confidence. That's possibly the first thing. It was one of my greatest problems when I went. You have to start off by remembering names and all this sort of thing, which helps them have confidence in you. Uh, you've got to be friendly, and yet you've got to remember that you are a member of a team of management. When you have these young graduates coming into industry, they've had lots of theory and no real practice about industry, and they just consider, you know, that, oh, well, I, I, I'm just that little cut above the ordinary factory worker. And it's so silly because the majority of those young people wouldn't be educated as well as they are if it wasn't for the fact of people like myself and many, many more who are taxed up the hilt to give them the opportunities they're getting today. I never go to the personnel office. I'd rather bring a problem home or even keep it to myself and go down to the personnel officer. The same applies to the nurse. I think I'd rather be dying before I'd go down or I'd be knocked unconscious or something like that and they'd take me down without me knowing.
after I've been at work for the 10 hours, I come home, just sit down and watch television before I know where I am. I'm going back to bed and getting up again. It makes me feel very depressed and fed up because we're going on Saturday mornings as well, so we've only got one and a half days off. When I daydream, I just think of myself out of work. I think that's about all, just lounging about all over the place. It's the best dream I've ever had. I became interested in the trade union movement when I went in the factory because I realised that it was only through the trade union that we could hope to better the chances for women. So I never go to any meetings, and I think that if I did, I should just probably sit there and laugh, you know, because I think they look so funny standing there waving their arms and their legs, and uh, just probably be, you know, seen laughing. I wouldn't listen to what they were saying at all. And the equal pay, well, with a firm like ours, I'm sure they'd be a catch in it somewhere. If we're all going to get equal pay, you know, they'd probably want us to work a lot harder. Among other things that I do during my work in the factory is visiting pensioners. The firm that I work for has very strong connections with its pensioners. There are a number of activities that they invite them to during the course of the year, uh, and they really do seem to look after them very well indeed. One of them in particular is Miss Smith, who's been retired for some years. Tell me how old you were when you started work. It's a long time ago. <laughs> yes, it's a long time, but I can still remember it. I was 14 when, you... when I left school, mm -hmm. and I was dying to go to players because all my friends were there. I worked in number one factory for 24 years on hand packing uh, oh, well, before they... they had the machines. I didn't realise, I don't think, how strong, how much welfare work was involved, because had I known, possibly I wouldn't have chosen this job. And yet, in a way, it, it is very basic, as I say, personnel work, and it is very much appreciated. While I'm doing it, I thoroughly enjoy it. Well, they do the round ones now. Once like we that. had the Australian cricketers round, and uh, Don Bradman, it was at the time. Oh, yes. He mm -hmm. stopped at that time, and he says, how do you, pick, how do, you do that? He says, uh, it's as hard as us playing cricket. He says, <laughs> I says, well, it comes automatically. We could pick 10 up like that, or 20. Yes, Never missed. Indeed. And they're so particular. They used to, you have to hold your hands out like that. And if you haven't got nice hands and nails and nice teeth, they'd turn you down. Good heavens. And oh no, any of my friends came out breaking their hearts because it turned them down. I was very nervous when I first went in. I hated it. From, we went into the training school. We were sitting around talking for ages. And all I could think of was going home. I wasn't going to go again in the afternoon, but I went. And uh, I hated it for about the first three weeks, and then we started having a bit of fun and we got to know the girls. But it never seemed to, you know, the, it's the atmosphere as well, I suppose. I just hate it. In the course of the work that I do at present, I've become involved with particular girls in the factory. I see them if we think that we can help them in any way. Insofar as it's affecting their work, this sort of welfare work is obviously best done by a woman. And this, I think, is probably why it was first decided in the early years of the development of the personnel department to have women as personnel officers. Having been at university and mixed and talked with men on the same basis, I now find that I don't do that any longer, or at least I tend to try. And uh, one doesn't get the same reception at all. You are on a different plane. Now, whether this is because I am in a strongly masculine-dominated company, um, and also industry is masculinely dominated as well, I suppose I've just got to accept the change, but it definitely is a great change from university where you are on an equal level. In fact, a lot of the time you're outweighed, and during my courses I always have been outweighed. Probably we get spoiled. Some women 
would rather be dominated by the male sex. I think they would prefer to, for, to be a second-class citizen. I've never accepted this at all. I think that um, any, any, everyone today should be on an equal footing, both male and female. sites like at Lucerne? Oh, they're pretty good. They're right down on the lake. That's where we thought about going. Trouble is, it gets very crowded. Well, we're going first two weeks in July. That's all right, by the way. Oops. What I have you done? Bleh. I think I just managed to uh, save it, but it's gone a bit skinned on top. It would be easier if I made it myself. Yeah, I know, but on the other hand, you, need, you were the one who rushed in and collared the seat. As far as I remember. Okay, uh, tea, coffee. There's okay. your coffee, it's the one. Yeah. That's okay. the one with that sugar. Okay. Right. Well, what's it like? Is there a beach? Uh, yes, it's a Lido. You have to pay to go into it. That's the only trouble. I see here, Tom, that there's a, a resolution from our own branch on this um, vexed problem of excessive overtime for women. Yeah. And uh, I hope that they're going to be successful because. We get so very tired, we've got no time for leisure or anything. There's one particular person that I know that husband refuses even to wipe a, a, a teacup because he said that her place is in the home after a certain amount of hours she's worked. Well, what did the firm say about it when you tried them? Before? Well, you know, you, you, you work there. And it's just one of these things, really. You accept overtime when you accept the rule book. There she was, just a walking down the street singing. describe myself as a typical teenager, you know, I do all the sort of things everybody else does, bit mad perhaps, follow the fashions sometimes, I don't just buy them because they're either mod or because they're anything else, I buy them if I like them, you know, it could be about two years behind and I see it and like it, so I'll buy it, I don't do anything outstanding, you know, I don't go around breaking the law every five minutes, I'm not that type, <laughs> you know, I like my share of the fun and if there's anything mad doing, I always go. I just like to have a fabulous time, you know. Well, we're going to the market square on Saturday afternoons and have a good time down there. You know, if the weather's OK, we sit down there for hours, just watching people coming by and taking the mick out of them, and just having a big laugh. <laughs> That woman sitting over there with no shoes on. No way. Never. Oh, she's gone. Do you see her? No, it's still. It's not them. No, my dear. That is your feet. I'm not surprised. Oh. Yes. Is that one over there? No, yeah, nosy. What do you mean, over the sunglasses? Yeah, the black hat. Yeah. Looks like she's ready for the Italian. Rivera, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that hat. Where? Well, look at that woman. Her coat looks like a draft board, don't it? I She'll know. Fabulous. I think I'll try it. Oh, sure. That soldier. It's, looks like he needs a bit of bresso on his hat, don't you think? <laughs> it makes me laugh how they always wear the hats so far down, you know. I don't suppose you can see where they're going very well. <laughs> oh dear.
we are done with the utmost Right. Hope we got the gears right this time. I think we've got the key. Make sure that chokes. Oh, what? It's always crowded anyway with children. It's a terrible road to drive down though, Tom. You know there's dogs and children and what have you, and they don't seem to care, just dart into the road. It's getting stiff. I haven't been married very long. I got married shortly after I came to the firm. We're hoping not to have children for a few years. Um, I certainly wouldn't work immediately after I'd had children, although I'd very much like to take up my work again, uh, ultimately. My husband is still away from home for most of the week. He's completing a course in Manchester. He's going to do town and country planning. And it does mean that we should have been separated for something like the first nine months of our married life, except for meetings at the weekend. This may seem very peculiar at first, it does to most people, but last year we were 170 miles apart and this year we're 70, so it doesn't seem nearly so bad. I married rather late in life. My one regret, of course, is that I haven't had any family. I, I love children and the only thing that I can do is, is to spoil my brother's two young, three young children who are here in Nottingham. But I feel that my marriage as a whole is very happy. My husband is very understanding regarding my trade union activities because without his consent, of course, then I couldn't do half the work that I do in the trade union movement. I'd like to get married when I was about 21, I think. Well, I don't know. I can't really set a time because, you know, I suppose... When I meet the right fellow, you start courting and that, and then get engaged, and then you just get married. So it might, I mean, it might be next year, I don't know. In my opinion, I've always said this, there are two evils. No, Over sure time and short time. Yeah. No, but sure. We go down to the local pub for the odd beer, but invariably, uh, with certain types of friends that I have, we get down to an old natter about voluntary overtime, which is a burning question at the moment in the factory. I feel that uh, at some levels in the trade union movement that women do have to become more aggressive than they would normally be to put over their point regarding the women's activities in the union. I feel that, um, there, you know, this whole maxim about uh, women having to be three times as good as a man to be on their level is, is quite true. No, you, you may be not rejoicing, Raymond, yeah, but if your firm... Um... I'll tell you quite frankly, it's interfering with my personal life. Ma, it it's, might it's be... I, I don't, I don't I mean, want my wife stuck at work till 7 o'clock at night. I, I, but can I just get a word in? Then you've got to go and get a meal ready. You've got to go in for a bigger basic rate, then. But, Raymond, let me just tell you. There's everywhere, isn't there? Look, can I just get a word in here? I've told you. The, the floor is open to you, Millie. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have these resolutions <laughs> down to our annual conference. Stop yet. <laughs> Look, it doesn't matter, Hannah. We must get this thrashed yeah. out. I'm yeah. about browned off as you are with this all this overtime. But as I've told you, we've got these resolutions down to our conference. And I know they will be carried by, I hope they'll be carried anyway, by a huge majority. Yes. I met Anne shortly after I came. She'd had a very long period of illness and I went to visit her in hospital during her second absence. Anne had a very unhappy home background. She's now living on her own and has been since a relatively earlier age. 
and we did feel she was particularly lonely and she was not well enough to return to work. We didn't know quite what to do or how far we could go in interfering with what was, after all, her private life. But I did feel some effort should be made to encourage her to meet some other people. I felt particularly inexperienced, I think, just this time. If you really don't care about people and you don't realise that the problems that they bring to you, which can be very minor almost, if you don't realise how much they mean to them and how far more important they are in their lives, um, then you're just not going to be no good at the job at all. I often think that I'd like to do something different, but I think, oh, well, if I leave, I've got to go somewhere else and be the junior all over again and work up, you know, until you get to know everybody. And I don't fancy that just yet. You sit and think, oh, what could I have done, you know, if I'd have had the advantages that you see the younger people are getting today. You realise that you have been robbed through no fault of society, really, that, that, you know, you're just sitting there doing this grinding, repetitive job and knowing full well that there's no hopes of any promotion whatsoever.